no matter what you do, you still want to be a human first and an athlete second. We never want to be athlete first, human second, because then what happens too is it's like you're talking about, like you develop very quickly, you have an identity crisis about like, well, who am I if I do not have X, if I do not have this? That's a really bad place to be. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one fitness and performance resource in Switzerland. In today's show, I'll be chatting with Matt Downey, strength and conditioning coach, educator, and mentor with Compound Performance. Thanks for coming on the show, Matt. Hey, thanks a lot for having me on, man. Now, it's a pleasure. So for those who don't know you yet, can you give a little bit of your background? Yep. So, hey, uh, my name is Matt. I work with Kyle Dobbs under Compound Performance, where I do remote training and mentorship and education for trainers and people who are looking to become better versions of themselves. Um, so what we're doing with our group mentorship is we're looking to educate people as much as we can on movement, programming, uh, biomechanics, and business development. So we're trying to really get like a nice full service product in here where um, we're not just teaching you how to use the stuff that we're teaching you, but we're uh, teaching you some like random stuff about biomechanics and movement. But we're also teaching you how to apply it to uh, clients so you can actually use it to pick up more business and build a better uh, business for yourself as well. So we try to be a little bit more full service um, just because we feel like it's, it's, it would be a disservice of us not to teach other people how to become the best version of themselves that they could possibly be and build a better business on their own. I love, I love that approach and I definitely want to come back to the mentorship service that you guys offer. But before that, I want to dig a little bit into uh, you and, sure. and, and your history. So could you talk maybe about some of the defining moments of your career as an athlete and as a coach so far? Absolutely. So when I was in, um, like I, I was, I, I really started my athletic career, my, my journey when I was very young, like I started training in martial arts when I was four years old. So I've, I've been training in martial arts from the time I was four um, I trained until I was 24 and then I decided I was done with it. Um, but in college is where I really got kind of serious about like strength training and all the things that I was doing with that. So I got into kickboxing and got into some, some like amateur fights while I was in college as a way of like keeping myself out of trouble. But I fell, in, I really fell in love with the process of like strength and conditioning while I was doing that. And mm -hmm. when I was about 22, uh, 23 years old, I, I, tore everything in my right knee. So I tore my ACL, my MCL, my LCL, my medial, my lateral meniscus, um, all at the same time. So that was a big, big shutdown from this. And I realized at that point, I was like, well, this kind of sucks. Like I'm like, whenever I'm competing, I'm making like $400 a, a fight. This is not really worth it for me. And my, my medical bill was like three grand. So I'm like, this is, I'm, I'm immediately like in the hole plus training expenses, plus travel, plus everything else. I'm like, this is not worth it for me. Um, but like that, that was where I really kind of fell in love with the, the, the process of like strength training because my physical therapist that I was working with at the time was awesome. And we had a really good job. We did a really good job of, of like rehabbing me back to like full performance. Mm -hmm. um, so my original thought was to move into more of a rehabilitative setting. But based off of what I've heard about a lot of people in the rehab world where it ends up being mostly just like 80 year old women that don't want to listen to whatever you tell them to do. I was like, yeah, I don't think that's going to be necessarily the move for me. So I got more into, into personal training and fitness after that. Um, worked with a bunch of gen pop clients in a couple different gyms from 2013 till this year. And then this year I fully decided to go private and uh, just work full time remote with Kyle and work privately as an independent trainer on my own. Do you, so do you still compete in any sport or? Are you I currently power lift. Okay. So currently I'm trying to, I'm, I'm training for some powerlifting meets. So you, usually it goes the opposite direction where people in powerlifting, they power lift for a while and they're like, this sport is stupid and they go to martial <laughs> arts. Um, but I went the opposite direction where I'm like, I did martial arts for my whole life. And I was like, yeah, this sport is stupid. I'm going to go to powerlifting, which is another dumb sport. So like I, I went the opposite direction of a lot of other people, but it's, I like to play by my own rules. So we'll see what we got. <laughs> I, like, I like that you call those uh, dumb sports, which is, it, 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 it you, is. Could, you could argue, you could argue about them, but I see, I see, I see your, your angle on that. Um, I, Powerlifting is a stupid sport. Like it's <laughs> like, what, what do you do? Like I sit down and I stand up, then I lower something down to my chest and I press it. Like, it's really not that hard. It's really not that smart of a sport. It's like slow. It's not athletic. Like none of it's like barely even a sport. Like I wouldn't even really, call it that it's something that I really love doing I really enjoy it like I've enjoyed I've been training for like strength and like training for powerlifting or training like a powerlifter since I was 17 years old and I've loved it for the entire time but I'm fully and I'm like painfully aware of how like dumb it actually is 
for, for those who, you know, still coach or still compete and, but coach like you do, can you talk about how you strike that right balance between coaching and then training? So the, the coach in you and then the athlete in you, how do you strike that balance? I struggle really hard to compete at the same meets that my athletes compete at. Um, so whenever I've had a, I've had a meet where I've had an athlete that I've, I've been, even if it's just one athlete that I've been coaching at the same time, mm -hmm. like that is a very, very, very challenging thing for me to do yeah. simply because I want to be able to focus on my athlete and focus on their performance. And I want to focus on their performance as much as possible as, as I possibly can. And I've actually had it happen before where I'm in the same flight as an athlete of mine. Mm -hmm. And it's like, at that point, like I, I have to, I have to decide who's more important and I have to decide if my athlete's more important or if I'm more important. And at that point, like I always err towards the athlete because like, I want to make sure that they're succeeding as much as possible. So I look at their numbers more than mine. I've set their attempts before mine. That actually happened in my last one is like, I almost didn't get my, my second attempts set on all of my lifts because I was more focused about my other, my athlete who was going, who was up after, who was up like after me, because I was, I was towards the end of the flight. He was towards the beginning. Mm. So like, he was the one that was up like very shortly afterwards. And I'm like, okay, we got to get you going. This is what we got to look for. This is what we want to think about. And like, I would just be watching him and they'd be like, oh, you're set, your attempt is set. And I was like, oh, whoops. Like I totally <laughs> missed it because I was watching him go. Yeah. So like, that's, that's one of those things is like, I've tried, I'm, I'm trying now to like, if, if I pick, competitions try to pick ones that I, like I don't have any athletes competing at because it just like I don't function well I don't multitask very well and I don't do well with that I don't know how it would be if I had a bunch of athletes in different flights I would imagine that would be even worse because if yeah. we have multiple platforms and there's people competing on both uh, like if I'm competing on one and they're competing on another platform at the same time I would just be such an anxious wreck that I'd just probably be over at that person's time the entire time and just bomb out and miss every single attempt because I wouldn't even be there and like they'd call my name and be like well uh, and I guess he's guess he's not here anymore and so what are some of the things that you've changed your mind uh around about since started coaching I've <laughs> that's a good question my mind has changed a lot about a lot of different things since the beginning of uh of, of coaching and I think that's one of those one, one of those questions that like it's going to make some people, some people angry. because like, there's a lot of stuff that I used to really believe in, but like now I'm looking at, it, I'm like, I don't think any of this stuff really matters anymore. And it's like, I think that a lot of what people argue about on social media is just such small minutia that it's one of those things where it's like, it's maybe 5% of what you actually see in a training mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. where it's like, people are arguing about like respiration strategies and we're arguing about like foam rolling and mobility and like all this sort all this sort of stuff. And it's like, yeah, none of that stuff actually even matters that much. So like if you have a well-rounded training program with good exercise selection, like most of those issues are going to clean them, uh, like that, that are looked at and like exercises that are chosen from a biomechanical standpoint where you're looking at the actual movement of that individual person, mm -hmm. right? More so than just like a, like a set archetype of like this person is X, right? If you're looking at it like that actual person as a, as a, as a whole or as an organism on their own, and you pick good exercises based off of what you see that person doing, all of these other things are going to kind of clean themselves up and none of them really matter anywhere near as much as I think a lot of people think they do. So that's one of the things that I've changed my mind, uh, my mind, upon, my mind on a lot is like all the, the kind of fluff that everybody argues about on social media that probably doesn't really matter as long as your exercise selection is decent. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Kieran and Flat always says it's like uh, shuffling chairs on the Titanic deck. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not going to change much it at all. It doesn't change anything. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't really matter. It's like the ship is still going to sink. Like, <laughs> right, that's, you're, still, you're still digging a hole, man. Yeah, exactly. That's on the, obviously on the pessimist side of, of, the, uh, of the analogy. So you mentioned biomechanics. So for those who are maybe not aware as, uh, or as aware as you are or, or mm -hmm. some of your followers are, uh, can you talk about biomechanics? What is it and why is it so important in, in everything that you do? So the, the biomechanics that we're looking for, we're, we're looking for is we're just looking to see how we can quote unquote, like, and again, this is another thing that I, I kind of will, will end up kind of talking about with this too, is like, is like movement idealism and biomechanics where it's like, like people think that there's like, like the ideal movement and like the ideal technique. And that probably doesn't really even exist either. Cause there's such individual variability from rep to rep of something, even if it looks the same, like if you're looking at like a, like an EMG study of something, and again, like EMG just shows activation doesn't show really much else. But like, if we're looking at an EMG study of like somebody's quads and hamstrings and glutes during a squat, every rep is different. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So that's one of those things where like technique is another thing, like perfect technique is one of those things where it's like, I don't even know if that's a thing that even exists, but what we're looking at with this is what we're, uh, what we're looking to do is we're looking to do, uh, and choose exercises that allow for as the, the greatest expression of range of motion that we can possibly allow for. Right. So we're looking without any kind of, of, of change in the body. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is we're looking for things that, that are like, like optimal levels of shoulder extension without rotation through the thorax or without depression in a rib cage or without any, like any kind of compensation patterns in the other, uh, in the other sections of the body that allow people to express max performance. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at doing is we're looking at using things uh, like picking exercises or picking drills that are going to allow for like full hip flexion, full knee flexion, full ankle dorsiflexion, full shoulder extension or flexion. And we're just looking to do that in a way that we can keep everything else relatively stable if mm -hmm. that is what the task demands. Right. So it's, that's another thing that I think is important to, to, to note, too, is like a lot of these things that we're going to do are going to be very task specific. So if we're looking at like a max effort deadlift or a max effort back squat, like we're going to get some extension through the thorax as we're going into that position. And that's probably going to end up being a stronger position than if you were not to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to like learn how to leverage those as much as possible, but to do those, we also need to be able to work on preventing those. So that's one of the things that we look, we're, that we're looking at is we're looking at allowing for, um, like just like full joint range of motion at all available joints in a, in like in the fullest way possible so that we can then leverage other strategies better as we do them. And as the, as we perform tasks that demand those. What, what brought you to focus on biomechanics? Not that it's a, you know, an obscure concept or anything like that, but, uh, where did that kind of hunger from you come from in terms of diving into it and really understanding it to its core? It's just one of those things that like the, the, the more I learned about sets and reps and volume, the more I learned that that matters, but it doesn't matter if all of your exercise selection is terrible. Mm. Right. Like, and that's one, that's one of those things is like, I, like I've, I've been looking at this from, from a, from a lens where it's like, okay, well, I mean, this is, this is how it's been in powerlifting from forever where it's like, what do you do? You squat and then you have some accessory work and it's like, okay, what, what is the accessory work for? It's like you front squat if you need more quads. Okay. Well, why is that one biasing quads more? Right. So it's just basically taking that, that, that lens. I feel, I feel like it's the next logical progression um, from where people start when people are even looking at building a training program in general, where you're looking at the actual movements and you're looking at the selection of why uh, of the, of the extra, actual exercises and you're try, trying to piece together why each exercise is there, right? Where it's not like there's a random hodgepodge of stuff that's thrown together all at once. It's all like actually like, like reasoned and sound ideas that make sense because of what you see in an athlete right so it's like the it's a, it's like i was talking about with front squats like everybody like that, that's been talked about from like the like the 80s and like the 90s in powerlifting where it's like if you need a bigger squat you should probably front squat more and what we're looking at with this is we're looking at like what is happening at the body at a, like at a joint perspective or at a joint level that is facilitated in a front squat that is not facilitated in a low bar, bar uh, low bar back squat mm. that creates the environment that allows for that to build up more quads or build up a better squat. And how could we maybe choose a better exercise that would do the same thing, be mm. able to drive a little bit more output and be able to still contribute to more to the total. Right. So it's like, for, for like, for example, like, a like if we were to choose like a, like a front squat versus a hack squat, like I would choose a hack squat literally 100% of the time because it gets the same kind of thing where you have a relatively vertical torso, you get mostly knee translation and mostly anterior knee translation. You get a lot more, you get a lot of work in the quads, but you have an extremely stable surface that you don't have to worry about stabilizing at all. Mm. So the fact that you don't even have to think about doing anything else other than sitting down and pushing as hard as you possibly can, can probably get us a little bit more output, which also because there's less of a stability component required, we'll probably recover a little bit better from it which means we can drive a little bit more frequency with it and we can probably drive a little bit more intensity with it. So because those boxes are checked, this exercise may be superior to a front squat, even though it's not a barbell specific exercise. So that's kind of what we're looking at with this is like, we're looking at, we're looking at taking a little bit of a deeper look into the actual exercise selection itself, figuring out why we're doing what we're doing and then trying to pick better exercises on top of that, that'll achieve the same goal in a more stable way that drives significantly more output. Was there, was there one, say, light bulb moment where you realized that this was the direction that you're thinking had to take next? Or is that something that happened gradually over time? 
I think this is something that happened gradually over time. Like I can't, I can't think of one defining moment where I was like, oh man, this is just the, what, what it is now. It's just like, this has just been like the, it's, it's kind of like I was saying earlier. It's like when we're building programs, a lot of times when you're, like, if you're, if you're curious about anything in general, like when you're building a training program, you're going to find out why things are doing what, you, uh, why things are happening the way that they're happening. And it's the same thing with like, if you're building a program for bodybuilding or for any kind of athlete in general, where like, as, as long as you're not building programs out for general population people who just need to probably just move in general and it doesn't really matter. We're not looking at training like the lengthened position of the muscle versus the shortened position of the muscle. We're just looking at general like total volume and output for those people. Like as soon as you start training somebody who's slightly more specific and you mm -hmm. see things that are starting to break down, you're starting to see limiting factors, you need to work on starting to address those, right? And like, that's another thing that comes with a lot of trial and error where you're looking at, okay, why is this happening? What can we do to fix this? And then how can we apply that to more people? And how can I take those lessons and learn and like apply those out to other drills and extrapolate those out to other things that I'm seeing that'll allow me to just kind of like take these principles that I've learned and just make them as, as applicable as possible to as many people as I can. Yeah, which is a lot more interesting a conversation. You, you say, you know, you ask why quite a bit. You might have said it five or six times in the last five minutes. And yeah. I think it's, it is the important conversation to have because when we talked about the hack squat and then the, the bells went off in my head in terms of the, the, the debate. I don't know how that's still even a debate of the machine versus non-machine and, yeah. and, and that kind of discourse, which is, it, it seems so surface level when you, when you just, even, you don't have, you don't even have to dig very far, but like you said, just considering those different things, you know, the stability component, you know, for some people, the, uh, Oh, it's a barbell. Hence it requires more stability. Hence it's better de facto just because of that, which mm -hmm. like you said, it depends what the goal of the exercise is. And if working on your, your balance and, and you know, how to stabilize a, a barbell in the front of your shoulders is not the main goal of the exercise, then maybe there's a better choice to be made. Exactly. And that's one of those biggest things, the, the things that I keep, talking about with a lot of people now is like machines are great because it just allows you to focus on moving the thing from point A to point B and not having to worry about anything else. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's the same thing that we talked about. Like the, the example of a front squat is great where it's like, if you're not an Olympic lifter, the limiting factor is going to be holding the bar on your shoulders. Yep. That's never going to be your legs. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I, if I care less about you being able to hold the bar in a good front rack position than you being able to drive significantly more total output with your quads, your mm -hmm. hamstrings and your glutes that'll allow you to have a bigger squat down the line. And that's the thing is like a lot of people will talk about the, in, like the, about like transference and like the transference to sport and it not being specific enough. And it's like, well, I don't really care. Like as long as you have some sort of degree of exposure to the stimulus that we're looking to, to build, like, you'll have some transference there because if your if your hack squat goes up let's say you're like you start your hack squat at 100 kilos and you get your hack squat up to 140 kilos you've gotten stronger so now when we go to when we go to continue squatting again like there'll be a slight little acclimation phase where you're kind of getting adapted to that movement again but then you're going to be stronger than you were before because you now have more muscle on your quad you're now stronger in that specific movement and that'll probably have some indirect transference over to your to your regular squat and that's one of those things that I, that I look at when I'm building out a training program, depending on the phase of training that we're in, is that's going to de determine the degree of specificity that we have in that training program, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, if I am, if I'm looking at like, like training a, like a power lifter, and again, this is like the, this is the example that I'm always going to come back to because those are the athletes that I primarily deal with, where if we're looking at training somebody who's a, who's power lifting and they're like 20 plus weeks out from a meet, like specificity is going to be very low on the, on the necessity scale mm -hmm. so they'll maybe have one specific um exposure to that stimulus per week so they'll maybe have a competition bench once a week a competition squat once a week and they might not even have a competition specific deadlift they might have just something that they're going to be working on that's going to be more um variability based and variability based could just be working on their off stance or working on a trap bar or working on something else where they're still training the gross motor pattern but we're training it in a way that's going to allow them to accumulate a little bit more volume and intensity but with the squat and with the bench, what I want is I want to have at least a little bit of specificity in there so they're, they're, it's never, never becoming a novel stimulus again. So they're always kind of staying relatively adapted to it. So we can also see the realization of the gains that we're making in other areas earlier and sooner. Right? And that's the thing that I want to look at is I want to look at a blend between specificity and variability in all my training programs. Because if I'm training a power lifter, like a lot of, a lot of people will get like 
flack for having like what they would consider to be like a barbell fetish where it's like i think if you're a power lifter like you need to have some sort of barbell specific movement in there because like we still need to have that ability to adapt to to skill and build tissue resilience in that movement as you're going through and getting stronger in your other exercises right mm-hmm. so i think that's one of those things that a lot of people miss out on um is just having some general level of exposure to it. and even if it's like working up to a top set of five and then doing two down sets of five and then doing all of your other exercises afterwards. Mm-hmm. Like you still have enough exposure to that stimulus that you can keep yourself, that you can keep this, the skill fresh, you can keep the neurological adaptations high and you can still like progress that one, but it has so little volume and intensity on it that it's not going to detract from the rest of your training program. So I think that's one of those things that a lot of people will miss out on is having a little bit more specificity in general with it in an off season and yeah. just throwing everything out to, uh, totally to work on all these other things. I, I think that from my experience is almost a little bit worse because we need to have some level of specificity in there yeah. so we can keep some level of like some baseline level of adaptation to that stimulus. Yeah. It's, it's almost like swinging the pendulum way too far. And then you have to go all the way back to your specific adaptations, getting closer to competition. It's like, exactly. it's like a, it's like a runner, a marathoner being like, Oh, I'm in the off season now. I'm only going to cycle. I'm, I'm only exactly. going to get on the bike. I'm not going to run at all. And then next thing you know, six months later, you have to relearn how to run because you haven't been exposed to it at all. So yeah, exactly. And then with that too, the, the other thing that ends up happening, which is, which is not good like especially with with when when the goal is something like performance you have to start at a much lower point which means mm-hmm. you have to start your prep much further out which means that you're never get, like you're, like your prep is going to just take significantly longer to go which mm-hmm. means we're just going to accumulate more volume in that in that particular area where if we have a little bit more specific things that we're doing beforehand you can switch in and get yourself into a prep at a, at a much shorter notice same thing for a runner right like if you're not yeah. running again it's like you said you have to totally relearn how to run Basically, like you have to like readapt yourself on how to run again, and you're going to feel like you don't know how you're doing anything at all, even though your cardiovascular base is probably going to be better. Your like your, your perfusion is probably going to be better, and you're probably going to be a little bit more efficient at like uh, shuttling out metabolic waste processes. Like you're still going to have to relearn the technique of running again. Hmm. Where it's like if you kept some of that in once in a while, like maybe once every ten days, you went on like a lo- like a long duration run or something like that you'll be a little bit better at it. We don't have, you don't have to prep anywhere near as long as you don't have to start, and you don't have to start your prep as light or as low volume and as low intensity, which mm-hmm. just accumulates a ton of junk volume that you don't necessarily need to have. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, if I'm, if I'm training a power lifter and they're doing like multiple sets of six at like 60% of their, of, of their max, like if you're doing a three by six or like a four by four at 60% of your max, like that is low enough volume and low enough intensity that that's just wasted effort. And all we're doing is we're just accumulating fatigue with no actual return on investment. So why would I have you do that when I could just have you be a little bit like, just like sacrifice a little bit of that variability for some specificity in the off season and then be able to start you off at a higher point when we're moving forward. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's almost finding that the minimum kind of maintenance dose of the specific work that you have to do in the off season. So that, like you said, when you go back, you're not starting from scratch. You already have a good base plus the, all the added work that you put in, in the off season. And now you're just off to the races. Exactly. And then it's, you just start off from a higher point. Right. So moving into exercise selection, you mentioned a few already, but maybe could you go over just to, so everybody really understands your thought process around them, take the, you know, the big three lifts and then for each one, maybe dissect, between you know two and four uh, accessory movements or complementary movements and why you would pick them you talked to you about front squat versus hack squat low bar mm-hmm. versus high bar so could you go over a few of those on on the three lifts just to, to give you yes yeah, for sure cool so, so if, I'm, if i'm looking at the squat what i'm going to be looking at is like the the typical limiting factor of the squat is going to be a lot of people are just going to kind of lean forward in the hole mm-hmm. and they're going to kind of end up like good morning uh, like doing like more of like a good morning with the with the squat to stand up and again if that's if the goal is to lift as heavy as heavy load as humanly possible that's okay like i don't really care i don't really care so much about how that's going to look and how that's going to be i just care if they if they're able to complete the movement right and they're able to get the 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 job done Mm -hmm. but what we're going to look at is we're going to look at doing like pretty like other exercises that are going to train probably like trying to train a different section of the muscle right so like if we look at where a barbell back squat is going to be the hardest like that is in the in the the hole so it's at the bottom at, at where your hips are like like 90 to below 90 degrees um, of range of motion mm-hmm. where the quad is in its most, le- most lengthened position in that 
context, right? So what we're going to look at doing is we're going to look at trying to train drills that are going to, that might train the shortened position. We might do some other drills that are going to reinforce the, the, the length and position of the movement. So we're going to look at just like different, different drills and different exercises that we're going to use to kind of like train other ends of the range of motion to help build tissue resiliency. And then we're going to also look to reinforce the same one that we can do a little bit more, right? So for example, what we might do with that, if we're looking to train the length and position of the muscle, we might do something like a banded leg press or a banded hack, or like, a, like a banded hack squat or a banded pendulum squat or things like, uh, like drills like that that would train the shortened position of the muscle when you're at full extension of the knee and the hip, mm -hmm. right? So those are gonna be exercises that are gonna just, that are gonna train the, the quad in a different position. And if we're looking to train the quad in the, in the shortened, uh, the lengthened position a little bit more, we might just have them do things like paused leg presses and paused like reverse banded hack squats and paused pendulum squats or paused belt squats or things like that, where they get to work on building a little bit more uh, volume and time under tension in, in that, and a little bit more mechanical tension in that paused position mm -hmm. so they can actually get stronger in that area, right? Which is why I think like, if we're looking at training the length and position of the muscle, like pause squats are gonna be one of the greatest exercises that you can do mm -hmm. because you get to sit there for two seconds. So you get to just build up a lot, like you get to accumulate a lot more volume in that area that you need to, that you need to train. And it's also specific enough that it's going to have a much faster transference over to your regular squat, right? Because it's, everything is the exact same. It's just a nice little load limiter that allows you to drive a little bit more volume and intensity and recover a little bit better from it because it's not going to be as heavy overall. Mm -hmm. So like, that's really the way that I'm, I'm looking at this is like, what I want to do is like, depending on how far out from a, from a competition somebody is, like if they're relatively far out, I want to do some things that we're going to train the opposite end of the muscle. So we're going to train some like the, the shortened position versus the lengthened position. So the same thing with like a bench press, right? A lot of these people that I deal with have like a relatively large arch in their chest and uh, in, their, in, their, in their back and a, like a wide grip in the bench press because they're looking at reducing range of motion as much as possible. But at the same time, we don't get much humeral adduction, so we don't get much actual pec contraction. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is we need to pick exercises that are going to allow them to contract a pec and adduct a humerus, and like horizontally adduct a humerus. So we're going to do things like machine presses, as long as the machines have a convergent path and they get a little closer towards the end. We're going to do things like dumbbell pressing. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do things that like try to limit that arch as much as we possibly can so we can get as much of a contraction in the pec as we possibly can and move the, the actual head of the humerus and move like and like have the the actual like insertion of the pec move closer to the origin mm -hmm. right as opposed to leaving it all the way out here and just allowing it to go through like some sort of like a semi contraction where it's only training like the most stretched and eccentric portion of the movement mm -hmm. we're looking at doing other things that are going to allow them to just build up a little bit more resilience in the full ranges of the tissue right mm -hmm. where it's like they're still going to be training that competition specific movement but they're also going to be training the opposite, uh, the opposite thing as well. So it's like, like I was saying, like machine bench presses, dumbbell bench presses, close grip bench presses, things like that, that are going to start training the, the, the shortened position of the muscle hmm. um, in a position that is not a big arched competition specific position, right? So it's like a very flat back, big focus on the reach up at the top so they can really focus on getting the full, like full range of motion out of that muscle. And for deadlift, it's going to be the same kind of thing. So like with deadlift, I find that like, just because that one has is a, um, like specifically like a competition specific deadlift is mostly just a concentric movement. Like there's very little eccentric load in a, uh, in a competition deadlift, right? Because you don't get any points for slowly lowering the bar down to the floor. You just <laughs> fatigue yourself out a little bit more than you would if you were to just like control the descent in general. So what I find with this is what we're looking to do is we're looking to do something that we can do to accumulate a little bit more concentric volume, maybe build up a little bit more eccentric volume, but usually accumulate a little bit more volume in general with a lot less axial fatigue and loading. So that's where for a lot of my lifters, I throw in the trap bar hmm. because it's a lot easier movement to do. You can hinge it and you can also kind of squat it a little bit. So you can create this kind of like hybrid hinge squat, which is probably going to be good for a volume from a volume accumulation standpoint, because we're not going to be hinging just anywhere near as much and with a trap bar if you're doing like touch and go reps it doesn't become an rdl very quickly like a regular barbell would it becomes more of a squat which is probably okay because squat is one that you can probably recover from a little bit easier than deadlift in, in general mm -hmm. so if we're still accumulating a little bit more volume with it if we're still able to drive a little bit more intensity with it and that's the other great thing about the trap bar too is like you can super maximally load it so like, like, for example, like I, I, I trained a lifter who like has a, his best deadlift right now is about 260 kilos and he's pulled 305 for five on the trap bar. 
Like he pulled. So like, what are you gonna like? What are you gonna say? He pulled one hundred and fifteen percent of his max for a set of five. Yeah. Like that's talk about that's, overload. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> you talk about overload. Like like one hundred and fifteen percent for reps is pretty freaking solid. And then when you go to lift, when you when you go to train anything that's gonna be lighter than that, it's not like it feels heavier because it's a barbell. Like the load is the load. So it doesn't feel like it, it's going to still feel relatively heavy, but when you go to your max on like a straight bar, it's not going to feel anywhere near as heavy as long as we have some degree of specificity to kind of like get you back into setting up and doing everything in the right position. So like, that's where, where I'm looking at with this is like, I'm looking at like drills that are going to allow people to accumulate a lot more volume at a higher intensity with as, with like equal or greater output than their competition specific movements that'll allow us to just have a bit more of a, like an either a direct or indirect transference over to their competition, competition specific movement. So again, if I'm talking about like a squat, that's going to be something like a leg press, a hack squat, or like a like pause squats or something like that, like depending on what the person, like the athlete actually needs, where if, if it's a bench press, what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at doing some like machine chest pressing where we're working on the shortened position, close grip bench pressing where we're increasing the range of motion and we're actually getting a little bit more shoulder extension and shoulder flexion and adduction towards the top of the range of motion or just things like that that are going to allow us to, to be in a slightly different position. And with those two, we're looking at not arching the back as much as possible. We're looking at just trying to keep everything as flat and as straight as we possibly can so we can work the opposite end of the spectrum as much as we possibly can. And with deadlifts, it's going to be whatever we can do to accumulate a little bit more volume with less fatigue. So that's going to be like a trap bar deadlift or a conventional deadlift or maybe even a uh, conventional deadlift or a sumo deadlift or mm-hmm. something like that that we're going to be able to just get a little bit more work done um, without having to worry about the recovery demands. And like another one that's great for both sumo and conventional deadlifts is the RDL. Like, I think the RDL is one of the most underrated exercises that exists. And like, it's very highly rated to begin with, but I think it's very underrated still because it's just such a good exercise for people to do. Like, if you struggle to get the bar off the floor, RDLs are going to help you. If you struggle to, like, lock the bar out, RDLs are going to help you. Like, if, it's just, if you struggle with grip, RDLs are going to help you. Like, it's just <laughs> one of those things where no matter what you have, the RDL is probably going to be a good thing that you can do, particularly because, like, it becomes a very heavily loaded single joint movement. Mm -hmm. Like the greatest thing, the the thing that has the greatest degree of range of motion in that is going to be just the pelvis and the hips in general. So the hips are going in the, in the, like a great degree of hip flexion and extension where the knee is staying relatively stable and the ankle staying relatively stable as well. So like smashing some heavy RDLs is a phenomenal way that you can, you can build up a lot more strength in your deadlift without as much fatigue because the load has to be a little bit less but the load doesn't have to be so much less than you think you would. Yeah. And there's also the component that you're starting from the top. You have the eccentric portion. You have a little bit of stretch reflex that you can use instead of literally starting from a dead stop at the bottom, which neurologically is a lot more taxing. Exactly. And that's one of those things. It's like, it's like we were saying, like you can accumulate a ton more volume in an RDL. Mm -hmm. Like I can have somebody RDL two to three times a week where Maybe, maybe they can only conventionally deadlift once a week because it's just so much more taxing and fatiguing on the system. Yeah. I've, I wanted to bounce back on a few points that you mentioned through, through this uh, little piece. So I've heard say in the realm of, of powerlifting uh, specifically in terms of squat range of motion that uh, you might want to actually limit your squat range of motion to what you would want to do in a competition setting so that you're not exposing yourself to potentially, you know, going much lower than you just should to make the lift and hence, uh, almost like restricting your own range of motion so that you're just doing what you need to, to kind of successfully lift the bar in competition. So you, you talked a lot about the different squat variations. What's, what, what's your position on this in terms of, do you go all the way to the bottom in a front squat because it is a different movement? Do you still try to kind of stay within the parameters of a competition lift if you're doing the squat competition style? What's your take on that? So my take on that is if it's not specific, I want to make it as non-specific as possible. That, I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to is if it's a specific movement, I want to train for as much specificity as we possibly can. Mm. So like, that's where we're going to be replicating the comps, like, like everything about the competition lift. So it's, it's going to be to the competition depth. You're going to set up the competition way. You're going to brace the competition way. You're going to do everything the way that we're going to do for the prescribed sets and reps and volume that you're going to look for. Mm-hmm. But for other things, I want to limit that as much as we possibly can because what I want to do is I want to, I want to be able to start training other ranges of the end, ends of the range of motion so we can build up deficits that develop. 
right? So that's one of those things where if you're consistently training the same position over and over and over again, yes, you are going to get stronger, but you're also probably going to be leaving some gains on the table by not training other positions and other ranges of motion, right? Where it's like we talked about it. Like if you only ever train the lengthened position of your quad, like that's it. That's all you've got. And it's like, you need, you should probably end up training the shortened position of your quads a little bit more too, because then you might not have a good, as good of a deadlift. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's, it's just one of those things where we need to start training both ranges of motion. And I think that when it becomes, when we're looking at like, like the, the, the movement continuum, keep your specific stuff specific. And then the stuff that is not specific to it, there's no need to be like, just like so emotionally attached to it that it's, it has to replicate all comp standards because you're not competing in that movement. Like I've never seen a power lifter go up to a bar and then front rack it and then do like a, like a half range, like, like a, like a, like a front squat to depth and be like, yeah, I got it. It's like, no, you're putting it on your back. You're getting a little low bar, wider stance position and just going as, as, as deep as necessary to, to get white lights. Where if you're looking at it from like a, like a front squat or a, like a hack squat, training that exact position is probably going to be like not giving you the same level of performance that you would be that you could be getting if you were to train it from a, from a greater degree or to a greater range of motion. So I want you to keep your specific stuff as specific as possible in terms of movement and like movement, like strategy, and then your non-specific stuff as non-specific as possible and just maximize your output in those areas. Yeah. So, so literally you're pushing at both ends of the spectrum, uh, the specificity and the, and the general side of things. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the thing that's the thing that I want is like if we're if we're looking at like trying to keep everything as, as specific as possible, like I just don't think we're gonna get there. Yeah, what and what are what are these implications in that on that continuum of specificity versus general? What are the implications uh, from a health standpoint and an injury prevention standpoint? Injury prevention is something that I don't know if we can really even predict reliably. So that's not something that I would be that I would know if we could even say that this is going to have a little bit more um, ability to prevent than anything else. But what the way that I'm looking at this right now is, and like I, I've had this conversation with a couple different people. So the, the way that I kind of frame this conversation is that we can agree that physics, we can all agree that physics exists. Mm -hmm. We can all agree that joint axes, that joint axes exist. And then we can all agree that uh, forces are going to be placed in different areas and muscle tissue is going to be the prime mover or the, 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 the agonist mover in certain different in certain ranges of motion based off of physics and joint axes. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at this in, in terms of fatigue management and volume accumulation, that's one of the other reasons why I want things to be as nonspecific as possible, because I don't necessarily want every single thing that a person is doing to stress the exact same tissues as their competition specific movement. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, if we're just looking at that from a, like from a physics standpoint, if we're looking at that from like, like in a low bar back squat, like the posterior chain is going to be the prime mover because the knee doesn't translate forward anywhere near as much. The body has to, the, uh, the, the torso has to incline, uh, incline a little bit or recline a little bit uh, to create the movement and to keep the bar over the middle of the foot. But because of that, we're probably going to be getting a little bit more lower back glute hamstring quad. Mm. Right. And it's probably going to go a little bit more in that order of, of muscle recruitment. Like well, when the knees flex, the knees are still, you're still going to be getting quads, but because of the position that the body is moving into, we're probably also going to be getting a little bit more glute and lower back. Yeah. Where it's like, if we're, if we're looking at this in a terms, in terms of volume accumulation, if every single thing that we're doing replicates that position as much as we possibly can, we are now robbing from our potential ability to perform better on deadlifts because we are now just recreating that same exercise over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Right. So we may not have as much that we can do in terms of, in terms of performance for our deadlift. So we may be robbing from that position a little bit more because we have an emotional attachment to this specificity mindset. Right. So that's what I'm looking at this as is like, and that's one of the biggest things that keep, people keep talking about where it's like, what, like load management is the most important thing. And I'm like, I agree, but that's why biomechanics matters because if we're looking at this from like, just like a physics standpoint, we can all agree that physics exists. So we can all agree that certain muscles are going to be the agonist in certain positions. So that we can all agree that load management is important in those positions, but then biomechanics doesn't exist and matter. Where it's like, I, there's like, I don't understand that, la that, like, that, that inability to bridge from like, okay, well that makes sense to, okay, then yes, biomechanics and exercise selection does matter for this because 
we're just looking at this in a tissue distribution and like a stress distribution uh, model and model and standpoint mm -hmm. where if we're consistently only training the same thing, yes, you're going to adapt to it. And like this, like specificity is the mother of all, of all principles and the mother of everything. And you're going to adapt to whatever demands you're placing on it. But at the same time, if we then have to rob from other exercises to allow you to recover from this because you're not respecting biomechanics and physics, I feel like that's just in, like, like a thing that you're doing that's going to rob people from, perform, uh, from performance mm -hmm. because we're not allowing to maximize output over the course of a week, a training cycle, or a training, like a generalized training block or a prep, which means that you may, be, you may have left gains and, set, and like, like some gains on the table because we didn't understand and respect physics, biomechanics, and tissue, uh, tissue management or like tissue loading something that's maybe less talked about, uh, but in the same realm of uh, accessory exercise selection, let's say on those, on those big three movements, can you talk about the mental components of, you were talking about the, the trap bar, for example, where you go super maximal compared to your conventional deadlift uh, and simply having different goals to aim towards versus just having the three big lifts that mm. you're going to do in competition and having kind of other things to chase along the way. So you don't mentally uh, kind of tire yourself out just going after the same thing all the time. So that's, that's one of the things that like I, I deal with, like powerlifters burn out quickly. And that's one of the reasons why people go to like other sports. And like I was saying in the very beginning where like usually it goes powerlifting and then martial arts. Um, it's because it's something that it, the, the, the tangible, there's, there's no, there's no end point to martial arts mm -hmm. where it's like, at, like your skill is going to continuously adapt and you're going to refine that over time as you're going through. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to get to compete and test that against people, but you get to test that against people. Whereas like in powerlifting, you get to test that in the same room as other people right? on the same platform, but you're not testing it against them. And like, I don't care what people, are, what people will say about it. It's like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going against that guy. It's like, no, you're not. Like you're going against yourself in the same room as that person in the same flight. Like there's no, there's not one thing about powerlifting that is like competitive against another person where it's like this strategy is important. We mm. need to figure out what we can do to place on the podium, but it's all, it's all an internal thing where you're trying to beat your own numbers. And that's where like the difference is with, with, with things like with powerlifting versus martial, uh, with martial arts is like with powerlifting, you have to be a lot more intrinsically motivated. So that's one of those things where you have to be a very data driven and uh, person that's going to look at it from a, like a numerical standpoint and just be interested in the process of getting stronger. Right. And that's the thing is like, I, I think like the mental aspect of this is like, you need to be able to remove yourself from it in general enough to be interested in the process, but not enough to kind of like burn yourself out. Because if you're, if you're sitting there, all you're doing is you're thinking about it, like you are not a well-rounded person. You're going to be boring and nobody's going to want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And that might be fine because that, that may help the like, catapult you to like a higher level and a higher strata of your sport. But with this too, like I think the, 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 the burnout is real because it becomes super boring to continuously only chase towards one thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of those things where it's like, I don't even know if this is answering the question that you asked or not. Um, but like, yes, I, I think yes. that's, that's, that's one of those things that we got to look at. We got to look at what we can do to kind of give lifters like what more things to do outside of the gym, because that's where I find that most of these people end up even burning out in general is like, they just don't have enough stuff to do outside. So it's literally all they think about and it's all they do. And like, that's not a good thing to only to be the only thing that you think about unless you're like one of the top 10 or like try, like have a legitimate shot at being like one of the best in the world. Yeah. And, and, and even, and even then, if you talk, think about a longevity perspective, you know, if you want to do more than win one year or win two years, if you want to really be there for the long run, you need strategies in place, like you said, outside of the gym, around what you do in the gym to get stronger mm -hmm. in order to keep it going. So that when, and you, and we know that within the competition realm, within the, the training for a sport realm, everything's not always going to go great. You might get injured. You might have, you know, uh, issues in the gym of you have kind of a, a month or two where things don't go the way they you want them to go for example and then what are you left to rely on if you don't have anything outside the gym you might you know you might get depressed from just having a bad session in the gym and that that's going to go against what, you, what you're talking about is you know being able to focus on the right things and, and move forward in time in a positive way yeah and that's what I think a lot of people miss out on is like no matter what you do you still want to be a human first and an athlete second we never want to be athlete first, human second, because then what happens too is it's like you're talking about, like you develop very quickly, you have an identity crisis. 
about like, well, who am I if I do not have X, if I do not have this? That's a really bad place to be. And it's like, yes, you need to be able to get into that mindset every once in a while, but you probably shouldn't live there. Because what if like something like, what if you were walking across the street and you get hit by a car and you're paralyzed now? It's like, oh, well, my whole life revolved around powerlifting. Now I have literally nothing. Mm -hmm. It's all over for me. Like that, and that's the thing is like, there, there needs to be other things that you are interested in outside of this that'll allow you to have some kind of something that you can do to bounce back because like, and this is one of the things that Kyle, like Kyle and I talk about in our, uh, in the mentorship a lot is like, we get a lot of people who, when we sent out our initial questionnaire, it's like, okay, cool. What do you do for fun? Like, well, I lift weights for fun. It's like, okay, so you teach people how to lift weights all day. You spend your time in a gym and then you go to another gym to lift weights and that's it. You don't read, you don't hike, you don't play an instrument, you don't do anything, you don't do anything else. You read about training, you train, you train people. It's like, okay, well, what happens if the coronavirus comes and shuts all of that stuff down? Mm -hmm. What do you do? And like, that's where we saw a lot of people that were just like freaking out and losing their, like losing their minds because they didn't know what to do when all of the things that they identified with got taken away. And like, that's what I'm talking about is like these people develop an identity crisis very quickly because I have nothing else if I don't have this. And that's not a healthy mindset for these people to live in. So what do you start with when you're, when you're dealing with someone like that, whether it's a coach or an athlete, what, what are the first steps uh, from your standpoint as a coach, as a mentor to try and get them to move towards finding other things to do in their life? So that's one of the, one of the things that like I'll, I, I talk about with, with all my weekly check-ins is just like, how is everything else outside of the gym? Like, tell me about, like, I ask in my, in my, in my check-in, my weekly questionnaire check-in uh, for all my remote clients, I ask them one question every single week, which is about like, tell me about you, something you did this week outside of the gym. And I want them to like really kind of get into detail about that. And if they don't do anything, like, if they say that, that nothing happened, I'm going to ask them about that one specifically. Mm. I'm going to say, okay, well, why didn't, why, why didn't you do anything outside of the gym this week? Well, it was like, it's all you did. So you went and you worked at the gym, you trained, and then you went home and just shut down. It's like, what did you do? Like, did you do anything fun this week? And like, that's the biggest thing that I, uh, that I try to do with these, with these people is like impart the purpose of having things outside of that. And like we're working with my clients or working with anybody in the mentorship is like having like the ability to, 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 create something tangible that's outside of that because like this is one of those things that like i talk about with people all the time is like we exist in such a small niche that nobody else cares about besides us none of nobody in the world like nobody else cares about it. it's like, like how many times have you gone to like a family gathering and you'd be like hey mom i hit a new squat pr and she's like oh that's great honey like she doesn't know what it means and she doesn't know like she doesn't care she doesn't know why it's important to you it doesn't make any sense so that's one of those things that, that, I'm, that I'm looking at is like, we still need you to be able to fit in with normal humans. So we still need you to do other things that will allow you to fit in with normal humans, which is why I always ask this, because it's one of those things where if you don't have that, if you, if something like the, like the, like COVID happens and you all, like everything gets shut down, a lot of these people become very depressed very quickly because they've got nothing else. Mm -hmm. And that's not cool. And like, that's not the purpose of getting into the gym or training in general. It's like, it's meant to enhance your life, not become your life. Yeah. It, it reminds me of when I was in the, in the army here, I did the kind of the long service here in Switzerland. So mm -hmm. I was in for about a year and a half and I would, so I'd be there from, you know, Sunday evening until Saturday morning when they released us. And so I would spend virtually, you know, 36 hours at home each week. And it was on the weekend. So I'd go out with my friends and all I had in my head was this little microcosm of the army that I was evolving in or had evolved in for, you know, months on end. And I had nothing to talk about. And I was, yeah. I must have been the most boring person at that time because all I could think about was the things that we were doing or that I was interested in, which were all related to the environment that I was in 24 seven. Mm -hmm. But like you said, outside of this, people didn't really care or they just didn't know how to relate because it's not the same world. Cause it's not the same world. And that's, that's the thing. Like, what I don't want people to take from this is like, that is, it's still an important thing to be able to get yourself to, mm -hmm. right? Where it's like, if like, but you need to, like, we need to, it's just the same, like I'm talking about with like movement variability. We need like human variability to be able to not only focus on this one thing, right? And that's what I'm, what I'm kind of talking about is like, is like for you, when you were in the army, when you're there, 
that is the number one priority and that's what you need to be focusing on. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And like, you need to be talking about it. You need to be living it. You need to live and breathe it because that's where you are. But then when you get out of that area, we also need to have the ability to be well-rounded enough that mm -hmm. you can then kind of transition back into normal people. Because at the end of the day, like it's like, it's like you said, you were there for a year and a half. Like imagine if like that was all you did for the year. Like how was it at, like transitioning out for you? Oh, I, I actually left the country for about a year and a half. <laughs> right. I just, I just didn't, I didn't even want to be here anymore. And I, I actually packed the bag and left to Australia for six months. And then I went to Canada, which is where yeah. I met my wife afterwards. But I, I just didn't want to be here. So it was actually a pretty, uh, you know, tough transition coming out of it. And I don't know if that was just a result of me being young and, you know, me needing to, to see something different. But I, I definitely do think that those 500 days in the army uh, didn't help in that transition yeah. process back to just, civil life. Yeah, it just burns people out. And it just, it just like you lose a lot of what makes you be able to connect to normal people. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the thing is like, if you don't have that, you have to do something where you compensate like what you did, where you leave the country for a while and you get out of it. And it's like, that's what happens with, with powerlifters where like the burnt out powerlifter goes into something like martial arts because it's so different. Mm -hmm. They now have something else that they can talk about. Where it's like if you were just able to do something like that in between and you were able to focus on other things like in the middle of it and not just exist in that small little microcosm, you might not have to worry about that anywhere near as much because you have other things that you can fall back on when things go poorly. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit more about, about the mentorship that, that you guys offer. So mm -hmm. uh, you said it's primarily directed to, to coaches. Uh, and so in that realm, can you talk a little, so you talked about the, you know, the weekly check-ins and everything you tried to provide. So can you go a little bit more at length on, on what that entails? So there's no, there's no weekly check-ins in the mentorship. I do want to just clarify that one, right, one, right, uh, one time. Just because those, are for my, those are for my athletes okay, in, okay. Uh, in general, yes. So uh, the group mentorship, the, what, we're, what Kyle and I are doing with the, with the mentorship, um, this, is, this is Kyle's brainchild. This is his, one of the things that he's wanted to do for a very long time. Um, is like, when Kyle started Compound Performance, he started this as a, like an individual mentorship kind of, uh, kind of, kind of thing where he was yeah. like taking individual clients only and working with individual clients on how to build a better business for themselves. Mm. Um, but one of the things that he talked about with, with it, he ended up talking about is like, this is, it's not a good, it's not a very time efficient thing for him to do because he had, he would be spending like 25 hours a week on zoom calls <laughs> with random people. And it's like, that's, that's a, that's a lot of, that's a lot of zoom calls a week, especially when every, when all of them are unique people and individual yeah. people, that is a whole lot. So what we looked at doing is, or what he looked at doing when he launched the group mentorship originally is looking at how he can take those exact things that he's doing with those, with the people that he was working with, standardize them into something that we can do to apply to every single person and then put it out in a way that we can teach as many people and reach as many people as possible mm. in a shorter period of time. So what we have with the group mentorship is we have a 10 week curriculum. We've just actually pared it down. Um, we've done a lot of reworking on this, this, uh, this year we've, now release two different new curriculums where the second one that we're going to do is going to be a little bit different again. Mm -hmm. um, that is looking at like, it, it's looking at like tangible things that you can do that give you a step-by-step -step process on how to build the best business that you can possibly build. Mm -hmm. So we cover everything from marketing yourself to uh, like, like, like on social media, to building out training programs, to building out Excel templates that you can use to train your people to programming and periodization, to service models, to intakes, consultations, assessments. We cover literally every single thing that you can possibly do. We do personality assessments, strengths and weaknesses assessments, organizational consulting. So they get, uh, people will get things like the Eisenhower matrix so they can decide what's, in, what's important and urgent, what's not important but urgent, what's not important and not urgent. And they can like qualify everything that they're doing to streamline their own process in a way that'll allow them to just build up the most efficient and effective business that they can possibly build. Um, and that's what it is. Is like we looked at a way of scaling up. Uh, Kyle looked at a way of scaling up the principles that he was applying to all of his individual mentees to a whole. And it's worked phenomenally well so far, in our opinion. Well, that's, that's fantastic. I'll, I'll make sure to, to drop the link in the podcast description for those who are interested in that. So circling back to you, I have a few uh, rapid fire questions to, to finish Let's the interview, Matt. So what are you currently fascinated about in this field of strength and conditioning? 
it's uh, biomechanics still. It's gonna be one of those things that you can like. There's you can never learn enough about it, and you can never learn. Um, like you can you can probably the human body is so complex, you'll probably never fully understand it. So it's one of those things. that's a constant pursuit for for me because I think it's just fascinating. What do you wish uh, to see more in the strength and conditioning field at this point in time? Mental variability. Uh, so the the ability of people to not just come on and talk about the exact same, come on podcasts and talk about the exact same thing over and over and over again, or just like repeat the same thing in the live in the same little echo chamber that they live in and talk to people about all the time. Do you do you have any strategies that you use personally to not kind of stay in that one lane all the time? Yeah, I only post about fitness stuff on my Instagram, and I don't talk about it with anybody else at all. So like my, my Instagram is literally purely fitness related content. I post none of my personal life stuff. And then I have all my friends that I talked about like regular, like human things with. Do you, do you make a point of not broaching any of those topics with the other people in your life? I try not to like, if people ask me things about it, then I'm going to talk about it. But like, it's, it's a very rare conversation to happen. And usually when it does, like I'll finish the conversation. I'll just be like, Oh, that was exhausting. Like you can drag fitness stuff out of me once in a while, but like, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. The, the mental availability uh, answer. What, what have been some of your, or who have been some of your biggest influences so far? Uh, biggest influences on, on, on me as, as, uh, as a person, like I work with the, the strength athlete. So my current coach is honey from the strength athlete. Yeah. Um, he's been a huge influence on me for uh, just in terms of, uh, like programming and, and, uh, like programming and periodization. Mm -hmm. uh, Kyle Dobbs, obviously my business partner in terms of business development. Uh, people like Pat Davidson have been a huge influence on me as well. Um, just in terms of like the way that he looks at building out a training model or a training program or like, uh, like a training, like, uh, like periodization. Um, and people like Chasm Hansen for, for biomechanics have been another big influence on me as well. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you had to recommend one book uh, for coaches to check out that they've probably never heard about, what would it be? Don't read a coaching book. I don't like, I've never, I do not read any fitness books at all. I, I like, that's one of those things that I'm talking about with like the mental variability. Like I only read like historical fiction or like books that are unrelated to coaching and training. Because like, if you look at the underlying principles of all of these, like they all end up like teaching, teaching similar lessons. Right. So like what I do is I read like fictional books because they have different, they, they're inter like interesting in different ways of tackling the same issues that a lot of these self-help books can will tackle, mm -hmm. but they tackle it in a way that that I'll, I'll make you that force you to have an imagination and think about things right and create like the 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 scene and create the outline of it in your head and create what these characters are looking like as opposed to some guy writing a self-help book just saying i'm better than you because i did this so so let's flip that or let's go one step farther in that what non-coaching book would you recommend to coaches uh, so I, I, I currently am reading a, a book by uh, Haruki Murakami and all Haruki Murakami books are about like the, like the, the human journey to like self-acceptance, mm -hmm. which is, they're, they're really cool. So the one that I'm reading right now is called the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. And uh, so far this guy, the guy, the protagonist in this has spent about like 200 pages at the bottom of a well. Um, just like sitting in the bottom, like he climbed into the bottom of a well on his own. It's pitch dark and he's just sitting there thinking about everything in his life. Mm. And like, that's what, that's what I'm talking about. It's like the human journey to self-acceptance with this is it's a, it's a fascinating thing because you get to just sit there and read about this guy going through all of his different experiences, understanding and talking about what he did that he messed up on and then trying to figure out how he can fix them on his own. But it's the same kind of thing that I was that I was talking about earlier, where it paints and builds an actual picture for you as a person that you have to think about and create in your own head. So it allows you to be a little bit more creative in your problem solving because it doesn't just say, "Here's a step by step formulaic answer on how to fix your life." You actually have to think about things and learn for and learn for yourself and like do some critical thinking. Is that is that something that you guys talk about in the mentorship in terms of reflecting on yourself and and what yeah. you do and how you see things? Uh, maybe put them down on paper. I don't know how, yep. how you guys do that. Yep, we absolutely do a personal strengths and weaknesses assessment. And the hardest mm -hmm. thing that we can get people to do is talk about their personal strengths. <laughs> what are your personal strengths? My personal strengths is like I'm, I have a I have a good personality and I can mesh with a lot of different people. And I, I I've never met a stranger, so I'm really it's really easy for me to talk to a lot of different people and broach a lot of. Uh, and broach a lot of, uh, of um, niches and realms with this so I can talk to a lot of different people. Um, and one of my other personal strengths is just I, I just care a lot about what I'm doing and the people that I'm working with. So what, I always, like, what I've always tried to do with all of my clients is that that particular client is the most important person to me at that particular time. Mm -hmm. 
right? So if they are, if they're talking to me about whatever they're, whatever it is they're talking to me about, that, that is the most important thing that I'm going to do at that particular moment in time. So I want to re- let that reflect in whatever my interaction is with that person. Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. For people who don't follow you yet, where can they find you on social? So you can find me at Matt Domney on social media. And Sean, I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks a lot. This has been great. No, it was, been, it was great. I'll drop all the links that we mentioned in the podcast description. And I wish you a good day, buddy. Thank you too, man. All right. Take care.